like to welcome you all today to this very interesting and informative event. First, before we get started, I just want to introduce a couple of folks. First, we have Adam Zorowski, who's the Deputy Secretary for Energy and Financial Services, who helped spearhead uh, putting this event together and is doing uh, a lot of the activity uh, for the governor on decarbonization. So let's welcome Adam. Next time we'll give you one of those overhead yeah, things. Yes, that's right. And then I just, there's too many to thank, but I want to really thank the staffs of NYSERDA as well as the folks here at the Rockefeller Institute for putting this event together. There's a lot of hard work, a lot of cooperation and collegiality going involved with that. So let's give the staffs a round of applause for pulling this all together. Uh, so we're really here today to explore how to leverage large institutional funds to drive the clean tech economy, shrink the carbon footprint while maximizing investment funds returns. And specifically, we're here to help provide analysis and insight to the governor and the state controller, Tom DiNapoli, who have joined together to find ways to decarbonize the state's pension fund. This partnership goes hand in hand with the state's aggressive clean energy program, including the clean energy standard, the multi-billion dollar green bank, and the overall reforming the energy vision program that has transformed the landscape of energy across the state. This is an important meeting today to help us begin to create and shape a blueprint of decarbonization of the pension fund, which is a win-win-win. Not one win or two wins, but three wins for jobs, for our environment, for the pensioners' return on investment. Before we get into the activities today, we have two really dynamic panels, uh, I think you'll be really inform, uh, informed by them and, and uh, they're uh, smart to boot. I'd like, first like to turn it over to John Rhodes, who is the chair of the Public Service Commission. He is much happier now because he doesn't have to work with me. So I'll turn it over to John for a couple of words. John? So hi, thank you all for coming. I'm John Rhodes, uh, Public Service Commission. So um, basically my view is that we are in a really good state. Um, and I mean that kind of figuratively, or literally first, that um, this is a state, a uh, political, governmental entity that is doing things that work, that are doing things that are really good, and stands at odds with some of the deadlock that's gripped other centers of government decision making um, for decades. And we're also in a really good state because this state, New York, with its leader governor, our governor, Andrew Cuomo, is driving um, a clean energy and a clean energy economy agenda that is, um, really stands alone, is remarkable for its um, ambition and also for its substance and the reality. Um, <clears throat> and where I focus is really on you know, the underlying markets for projects, because we're not going to get our clean energy outcomes and our jobs and the like without steel and copper and storage and silicon going into the ground um, in ways that deliver on the results that we want. And we know we need a lot of those resources. And we can't deliver those physical markets at scale, we can't get 2.4 gigawatts of offshore and 3 gigawatts of solar and 50% of renewables by 2030. Some of his really remarkable, uh, not ambitions, but uh, targets, goal commitments, um, without scale in the tens and higher billions of dollars. And that has to come, the dollars have to come meaningfully from the private sector and they have to come in the form of investments, and they have to come in the form of finance. So while we are building um, on, uh, on the physical side, the, the, the scope, the opportunity for these projects, um, we are also building the preconditions for financial markets at scale um, that, can, that can really be meaningful, um, and by the way, can help our agenda if if finance and investment is attracted to these opportunities, and on the merits it should be, because these are really promising, high-quality, stable, 
good return investments, um, then uh, we can uh, create scale, we can create opportunity, and we can create the resources that we need. So it's, um, it's terrific to see this conference. Thank you, Jim, for uh, the initiative in organizing it and bringing together these panelists. Um, we really need this financial innovation and commitment and scale um, in order to get what we need. And <coughs> if all you need is the opportunities to put the money to work, that's what we're working on on our side. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, now I'd like to get started. The first panel of experts uh, will discuss how we deleverage portfolios away from fossil fuel investments to a clean energy and sustainability portfolio and dig really dig into why the timing of such an activity is right now. I'd like to call up our first panelist. We have Jerry Watson, who is the Vice President for Finance and Operations from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Come on up, Jerry. Jamila uh, Pettuccini, the Executive Director for Perella Weinberg Partners. Come on up. We have Henrik Jepsen, who is the head investor, uh, 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 head of investor outreach of the Northeast for the Carbon Tracker Initiative. And we have our one and only Alicia Barton, the President and CEO of NYSERDA, who did not have to work with me, so she's a much happier person than John. Uh, so I like the panelists sort of just to briefly introduce themselves, what they do, why they're here, and then we're going to have a moderated uh, discussion among the panelists. And then I'd like to turn it over to really difficult questions from the audience. That means, Dave, you can't ask any questions from the CBC. Uh, but we were going to start off, but I think it's important to get some of the background of our, our very esteemed panelists. So, Jerry, maybe you can start and we'll go down the line and then we can get into a little bit of a discussion. Um, almost four years since the Rockefeller Brothers Fund decided it was time for us to divest from that source, from the oil companies that we were still invested in. And thank yes. you. She is unmuting me. Um, I'll talk to you about Jamila in a moment. And besides <laughs> unmuting me, um, how she assists us in our endeavors. And we had, for numerous years, tried the engagement process through our investments. And because what had been happening was that climate change is an area that for the past 20-something years we have felt is critical to the survival of the world and all of us in that we must address it, we must battle it, we must try and really reverse the impacts and stop the damage that we have been doing. And so initially, like many institutions, we were engaging with our investments that were in the oil company, primarily through the efforts of the family, including um, putting forth shareholder resolutions. And we felt over time that as we were spending more of our grant dollars on battling climate change, we became very uncomfortable realizing that in our investment portfolio, we might have certain investments that were directly undermining the dollars that we were um, deploying for the grants. And so over a period of time, which really was right about when we were transitioning to Perella Weinberg as our OCIO, we came to the conclusion in uh, summer of 14, right before the <coughs> UN call for the battle of climate change and the uh, call for divestment, that we, this was a step we needed to do. And we were doing it because, as I said, we felt that it was important from a climate change aspect, but we also saw it financially. Uh, we were one of the initial funders of the Carbon Tracker Initiative years ago, and we have studied their research for many years, and, and our program director for climate change closely works with them still and keeps abreast as, and keeps all of us knowledgeable. And we really were persuaded that from a moral and a financial return that we, this was the right step to do. So in 2014, as many of you know, we did announce this. Um, and we've tried to be very transparent. If you go to our website, we continue to monitor our progress and we update our website to show you how we're doing. 
And at the same time, I can say we're very pleased because our mandate as a foundation, which we revisit every 10 years with the trustees, half of whom are family members, the question of many foundations, are we um, sundowning or we are in, are we in, a, in existence for perpetuity? And we continue to have the goal of perpetuity. So in order to do that, we have to have financial returns that will preserve that purchasing power of the endowment because we also, of course, we want to be making, a, have a robust grants pool. So we're balancing both needs and we are able to accomplish this through the work of Perella. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. It's afternoon, not morning. Um, uh, my name is Jamila Pettuccini, and I co-lead our Mission Align Investing work at Perella Weinberg Partners. Specifically, I work on a what Jerry references an OCIO, an outsourced investment office. So we tend to work with university endowments and private foundations like the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and manage their in, and manage their portfolios in its entire entirety on a discretionary basis. Um, we manage uh, approximately $9 billion, obviously a lot smaller than the public pension funds in the state of New York. Um, uh, and of that nine, approximately $3.3 billion is in a mission-aligned investing mandate. So those are foundations and universities that either are looking to get out of something and remove something from the portfolio or actually invest and lean into certain investments that are aligned with where they see the world going or also where their program-related activities are. Um, prior to joining Perella in 2015, I was um, a Vice President of Sustainable Investing at Harvard Management Company um, and led strategically how they were looking at environmental and social and governance issues across their portfolio. Um, and prior to that, I was actually at CalPERS, a large public pension plan out in California, and doing a very similar role and was integral in their work on investment beliefs that are not only looking at environmental and social and governance issues, but also looking at our markets are efficient, how are we looking at risk, and especially in the context of beneficiaries and very, very long-term investment horizons, what does that mean for investing and where the world is actually going? Um, I will now turn it over to you. Fantastic, and um, thank you. My name is uh, Henry Gebersen, and I'm the head of investor outreach for Carbon Tracker, focusing on North America, but also a large extent a large extent to the European market as well. And you can probably hear my accent, I'm not from around here, but uh, from Denmark originally, but been in uh, New York for 11 years. So I bring a bit of a perspective both from Europe and also from uh, the US. Uh, Carbon Tracker was uh, initiated back in 2010-11, uh, at least formed as an organization with uh, the support from uh, Rockefeller uh, Brothers, and which we are very happy for. And really started with the, uh, with the focus that this is from an investment point of view that uh, it doesn't make sense if we want to decarbonize and if we want to lower the uh, car carbon emissions out there, if we have to we look at the imbalance that actually exists between what is allowed according to climate scientists and what is available if we look at um, the reserves and resources that these different oil, gas and coal companies are sitting on and are expecting or want to deliver and extract that will em eventually lead to emissions out there. We found that there was a ma very big uh, imbalance between that. That led to our first report called Unburnable Carbon, uh, which was uh, heavily influencing uh, Bill McKibben in his uh, Rolling Stone magazine article, The Terrifying Math. And I think uh, then it's been going hand in hand from there on to have a very big impact around the uh, world. And we have had a lot of uh, focus and impact and uh, response from the financial community. Uh, we are a bunch of uh, financial investors, myself, and I uh, have close to 20 years experience from the buy and sell side, uh, working primarily with uh, um, Nordic or European equities. Uh, coming from, I worked at ECB Enskilda, which is uh, one of the biggest bank in Sweden. We had a very big presence in Norway, so I have been around selling and uh, raising capital for a lot of oil, gas and uh, companies and also oil service companies, so I know a lot of what it is that investors are looking at and what they're not looking at especially. And I think that's a lot of the stuff that I bring into, into our view. But our focus is really to come out, do the financial analysis, because uh, we can't really move a lot. And investors, and especially f fiduciaries, will also have some evidence that they need to point to to make sure they can justify their different uh, decisions. So we have done a number of different reports. Some of the la latest one uh, I will highlight one is two degree separation. Uh, all of our reports, uh, uh, by the way, are freely available on our website, uh, carbontracker.org. And uh, there's a lot of different uh, research we have done here. But we really try to come in and quantify and say, well, we can't burn it all, was our first conclusion. 
Our second one is then who gets to burn what? Because we're not saying that uh, all carbon emissions should stop tomorrow, uh, although that would be a good idea, but uh, from economic jobs and all this point of view, that's probably not possible. So, but we have to have a structured approach of how can we assess who is more at risk than, uh, than others. And maybe I'll stop here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah? Great. Thank you. <laughs> Again, I am Alicia Barton, President and CEO of, the, of NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. We are on the front lines of uh, Governor Cuomo's extraordinarily ambitious and, as, as uh, my colleague John Rhodes framed out in the introduction, incredibly smart uh, clean energy and climate agenda. And we, uh, I, I think, bring the perspective in this conversation of being uh, very close to what are really rapidly growing markets for clean energy, both uh, here in New York and beyond. We, um, uh, are looking to implement uh, some of these top-line goals, um, uh, a couple of which I'll mention just to, to frame out the, the, the targets that we are focused on hitting. Um, and I think John you know, referenced these indirectly, but just, just to make it a little more clear, we, we are uh, committed to moving the state to an electricity supply that is 50% renewables by the year 2030. That's a significant increase in new renewable energy in the state. We are uh, uh, looking to uh, have that made up of uh, uh, a mix of new renewable energy resources, including offshore wind. We're moving aggressively on offshore wind as well towards uh, what would be an extremely uh, substantial new renewable energy market uh, for the United States, uh, located here uh, uh, right off our, uh, the coast and uh, here in New York. And, and also aiming at um, uh, you know, a suite of other policies on everything uh, from uh, efficiency, storage, electric vehicles, and the like. And what we're seeing uh, in doing that work is uh, that we are, we are making progress faster, I think, than, uh, than people really anticipated even just a few years ago. So to bring that back to the context of um, investment portfolios and the investment opportunities, uh, this is clearly the place where we are seeing growth in energy markets. Uh, John referenced that these are good investments with, uh, you know, stable long-term returns. They're also uh, the the best growth areas, and I can I can talk more about that. So for uh, for a number of reasons, the uh, the the activity that we're seeing on the ground is really uh, uh, not surprising. That this would be the right moment for. Uh, 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 consideration of a broader strategy. And that's why it was so exciting to see the governor uh, really uh, leaning into uh, the comprehensive ways to think about this issue in his uh, State of the State address earlier this year, where he called on the Common Fund uh, to divest, uh, making um, you know New York the first state to make such a commitment, which was really incredibly exciting, um, and, and followed that up uh, to, to show that uh, we're serious about doing the work by um, announcing in, in coordination with the, uh, the state comptroller, uh, Comptroller DiNapoli, that uh, the state was forming the first um, decarbonization advisory panel to really do the hard work of digging into what it would mean to uh, uh, fully divest the common fund uh, in the years ahead, in addition to also looking at ways to leverage uh, that opportunity to drive even more investment in these clean energy markets that we've already been uh, 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 triggering for private investment through the suite of other policies we've been working on in the last several years. So this is uh, uh, an exciting moment for New York to be playing uh, such a leadership role in leading this type of conversation that's taking place in all the, all the global markets that, that we've been talking about. Great. I think that actually lends itself to opening up the discussion. First, Henrik, your accent reminds me of Queens more so, so you surprised everyone. But <laughs> I think the question what Alicia really raised is the right one. We're talking about a large public pension fund of more than $200 billion, right? So it's a real large fund. And it was nice at one point to be talking about environmentally minded investment at one point. But how is the, why is this the time where pensioners are worried about their return on investment, right? They just want to make sure that they're getting their pension. The state taxpayer wants to make sure they're not going to make up for it. How is this the right moment? How can you construct a portfolio where you are decarbonizing or de uh, de divesting from sort of carbon-based companies as that's defined in a way that 
taxpayers and pensioners can be assured that, wow, we're, we're for environmentally friendly, but we don't want it to be just the thing where we suffer at the, as a result. How are you guys doing things in Rockefeller, or how do you put these things together to ensure all those interests are balanced? So maybe Jerry first. Sure. Well, um, we're not talking about specific performance, but um, what we do is we track against benchmarks, both a conventional benchmark, but also a fossil-free benchmark. And one of the other points, and of course, we've only divested in uh, 2014, so actually I misspoke, it's about three and a half years now. So we really, to have a meaningful period of time, you need, say, 10 years. But one of the um, parameters that we are tracking, and it's interesting in that since 2010, at the MSCI has been tracking the trend between the MSCI conventional ACWI as well as the ACWI less fossil fuels. And since 2010 through 2014, they were pretty much tracking almost identical. But from 2014 on, the fossil fuel free one is now um, going ahead. I think just as of uh, this morning when I looked at, which is the March data, it was about 210 cumulative performance during that period, whereas positive performance, whereas the uh, conventional was at 199. So it's not a huge spread yet, but all of a sudden since 2014, it's starting to change so that the pensioners can see, um, again, this is one piece of evidence. We need more longer term to really have a concrete case, but it's showing the trend that this, again, as we had been confident in 2014, that this is the way to go financially because of the work that they can't all be drilled. So the, they're going to be losing money. And this is why we felt that it was um, one of the many reasons we felt that we should be doing this. Well, not, on spe and not to get in specific performance, but how did, now that is a good worthwhile investment, right? You don't invest in things that don't work. Is it because of state policies of what's going on in states like New York and California? What's driving the positive return in decarbonizing or disinvesting? Are they state policies? Maybe we can have a discussion around that. What's making it grow in that sector versus the, the typical gas and oil sectors? Well, maybe I can, maybe I'll take a punt here. I, um, I, I think the, the, the key thing to, to remember, and that's also from the original research we, we did, if you look in general at investments, it's, uh, people will always say, well, things are going up and down in cycles, and this time it's different. Uh, I don't know how many times I've heard that uh, talking to investors, and therefore they buy into this, or they have the dot-com period, and we have all these other housing bubbles and all these other things. Uh, I think the carbon bubble, as uh, we came up with the, the expression to try and define what, what is actually going on here, I think that's a little more structural, a systemic change compared to some of the other things we have seen before because we have an outside constraint which is oh, the outside is we have a constraint in how much carbon can we emit uh, and I think there's not really a lot of uh, discussion about whether we can just go ahead and produce all the carbon in the world or we have a limitation on that there might be some who are disagreeing on whether or not carbon or sorry climate change exists or not but we are uh, firmly believing that we have problems and we can just see the weather and all these other things happening on a, uh, we can see on year, to year by year, everything gets worse in, in a lot of areas. So something is happening, and that also means that we can't go ahead with doing the whole thing. And then suddenly, instead of it's a, you can say, a normal bubble that is human uh, created because of high speculation, this is about how much carbon can we emit uh, out there coming from oil, gas, and coal primarily. And uh, that means that a lot of these sectors here are structurally changed, changing because it's no longer that uh, the reserves they have drilled and they have emitted, uh, they'll just be replaced. And then, therefore, if you look at the, com the valuation of companies, typically you will take what reserve does a company have, and then you put on some multiple, and then you say this is a quick way of saying what the value of Exxon, Chevron, etc. is. But that all assumes that reserves can continue to be replaced, maybe grow. But what happens if that is not the case? And that's why I think a lot of people are starting to have some impact and say, well, maybe some of these things are not happening uh, and will not have the same replacement coming out in the future because there will be a limitation on the, uh, on the emissions out there. So I think that is some of the changes that is happening. But I think we can also be fair and say, well, this time it's different. Well, we also had a conference of events happening. Uh, OPEC decided to go ahead and produce and try to kill off the shale production here in North America. Uh, that has been un unsuccessful, so they are a little bit cap uh, captured. So we actually have that there has been an, 
oversupply of oil for a long period and that has uh, taken down the oil price. Uh, what has the result of that been? Well, there has been that a lot of fossil fuel related companies have underperformed. Uh, now we have had a year, number of years with under investment in the area. Uh, all scenarios, models for demand outlook still predict that there will be at least fair amount of oil investment needed for the coming years. So uh, if you talk to hedge funds, if you talk to investors, some of them are very, oh, maybe there will be a rebound in the oil price and that will come back. I think the key thing here will be, will there be an inflection where investment will follow up if the oil price come up for a period? And that I don't think is so, uh, is, is so clear. And if you say that the uh, like decoupling is starting to happen, then we actually have that uh, the energy transition is materializing for investors. And then it's uh, a bad idea to be on the wrong side of that, meaning heavily invested into, into the oil and gas sector. I think the question is, where is the puck going? And so if you're a large asset owner, like any pension fund is, you are thinking in not necessarily quarters, obviously you're looking at quarterly performance, but you're also thinking in you know, one, three, five, ten years. And not only that, you're thinking about even if you closed your doors today, how are you going to pay pensions in 40 years or 50 years? And I think we can all probably agree in this room that the world in 50 years is probably going to be pretty different than the world it is today. Um, on a variety of fronts, climate change, looking at artificial intelligence, looking at technology, disruption of a variety of sectors. So where is the puck going? And I think if you look at, and not just the issue of looking at decarbonization or looking at the fossil fuel or traditional energy industry, but looking at environmental related risks, so it could be climate change, it could be you know, carbon emissions, it could be looking at resource um, uh, uh, scarcity issues, it could be looking at you know, human rights issues, it could be looking at supply chain resiliency or governance and independence. All of these issues together, when you're thinking about as an asset owner and you're looking at both publicly listed companies but also private companies, is you know, what these issues matter in terms of reputation. They matter in terms of value and they matter in terms of performance. And they play out, obviously, in different ways on different time horizons. And so I would kind of reframe the question a little bit. And it's not just about in the context of looking at divestment as an action, but it's also looking at what are the, what are the climate risks, both physical risks of climate change on a portfolio, but also then looking at the actual policy risks um, as well uh, in terms of the context of a portfolio. And what does that mean both at the macro level, but also looking at the micro level view too. And there's going to be opportunities that arise. So opportunities and investments that are looking at you know, new insurance products. Um, there's also going to be a lot more risks that arrive in looking at you know, real estate portfolios that are in low-lying areas or coastal plains or floodplains. And so it's, it's, I think it's looking at through the prism of risk in the context of where the puck is going um, as opposed to sometimes um, thinking of it just from a sort of binary like get out of fossil fuels or then invest in fossil fuels. It's very unfortunately or fortunately it's a very complex gray discussion. <laughs> Even once you, you know, you kind of, as, as an investor, right, you make a decision, you're, or you have an awareness, you see the puck, uh, uh, you know, traveling down the ice and, and, uh, and you're trying to assess risk, it's also, you're confronted with the decision of what are my alternatives then? And that's, that's really where I think, you know, again, this is a, a, a different conversation today than it was even three years ago, let alone five years ago, let alone 10 years ago with the incredible explosion and growth in renewable energy markets and clean energy markets uh, globally, nationally, and, and certainly here in New York as well. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it is very much the case, um, Jim, in response to your question about, you know, in the U.S., state policy being a significant driver of that growth. There is no no two ways about it that we would not be seeing the uh, incredible amount of activity in, uh, in renewable energy markets here in New York without the forward-leaning policies that have been put in place over the last several years. But it's very much that, that confluence of a number of things that Henrik was mentioning, which is that happens at the same time you have forward-looking policy, you've got, you know, technology improvements that are actually shattering records beyond, you know, what people could envision just a, a few years ago. Um, you have, uh, you know, again, these uh, relatively newer markets reaching scale, which means they're getting more cost competitive and uh, uh, therefore they're growing even faster because the costs are so attractive. So you have this virtuous cycle of growth feeding, feeding a trend where, um, you know, last year in the United States, virtually all of the new installed capacity in the United States was renewable. 
we really have reached the point where, again, if you're looking for where the growth opportunities are as an investor, it's all in the renewable space. That's where we see it. And of course, the, uh, you know, many of the, the major oil and gas companies and major utilities in the United States as well are, are seeing that trend very much and adjusting their own um, uh, business model accordingly. We can maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. I, this, it, it lends itself, one of the issues, sometimes it's philosophical and sometimes it's a business decision, but, and I think it's what folks in New York State with the pension fund are wrestling with now is what's the better return on investment? There's a, philosoph a philosophy of the way you do this is through engagement. You use your position as a large institutional investor to change behavior within a company, right? So you go to the large oil company say, if you don't change your behavior, then we're going to exercise our weight as one of the major investors in that company. Then there's the movement on just divesting from those companies in your fund generally. Sometimes they're treated as mutually exclusive things. A, is, do they have to be treated as mutually exclusive things? Do you have a sort of perspective on one view versus the other? And how do you kind of put that all together? Is there a combination thereof um, as a strategy of in terms of changing behavior in the industry and, and in the marketplace itself? That's like an eight-part yeah, question. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You, you <laughs> chose whatever part of the eight you'd like to answer. We, as I said, um, are the, through the family, had uh, tried the engagement approach with one particular oil company um, specifically, and trying to ha get gain more transparency into any assessments they had been doing as far as the climate risk and the, therefore the financial risk to their own company with all the information that we were seeing through Carbon Tracker and, and other scientific research. And there was not success in that. So, which was, as I indicated before, one of the reasons we took the approach that we did. Um, we are one of many uh, philanthropic institutions and individuals who actually, we then formed together a group called Divest Invest Philanthropy, and there are, this represents $6 trillion worth of assets under management. Doesn't mean that $6 trillion was all fully divested, but these were the assets of the institutions that gathered together to, uh, and went and grew over time. And the first few years, as was indicated, was really on the divestment. Now we're really seeking the opportunities to reinvest in the renewable. And we're seeing more progress through our, our work with Prog um, Perella in opportunities in the pipeline that will meet the needs that we all have. That was a challenge in the beginning. But I mean, what we as an institution are often asked to talk to other foundations about how did you come to the divestment decision? What was the analysis that you may have done? Were you willing to lose money in the long run? Which, as I indicated before, the answer was no. Our objective is market rate returns and risks so that we can be around forever for the uh, family to con continue to um, influence and, and address the needs. But what we were finding uh, is, and what we tell people is, these are the reasons we did it. And we believe it is the right choice for us and for many, but it's a very important tool in the box. We do have some other peers that have yet, not yet decided to join us in this, and they are going on with the engagement. And there is some influence there that can be done, and just this morning, one of the largest Nord Nordic pension plans, I think, actually, instead of divesting, they're, they're now going back to the major oil companies and saying, we will continue to invest with you if we are serious about really increasing your dollar spent on pursuing renewable energy. So for a, a, the size of that particular fund, that will have great influence. Um, for us, we felt, and again, partly because of the name of Rockefeller, we, we knew in the beginning when we were going to divest, it was not at all for publicity. It was because, as I said, for moral and financial reasons, we thought it was the right choice. We did expect to have a little bit of publicity. We had no idea that it would have the story that it did. And which the benefit of that is it really has helped us through our work with Perella. There were some funds after we first divested that Perella would try and invest us in and they would say, the manager would say, no, um, Rockefeller Brothers Fund only wants us if we are willing to carve out a divested sleeve for them and we're not ready to do that. And we said, fine then you know, we won't be investing in you, and, that, and that's fine. Um, we're not that large, so maybe we're not influencing you. But some of them over the next year or so did come back. And we're seeing more and more, and as I'm sure all of you, many of the mainstream large Wall Street firms are starting to accommodate 
and pursue this. So we think we are influencing through the divestment versus engagement. Yeah, I think you have to, I mean, to me, it's like you need to all the tools at your, at your disposal. Clearly, I'm making noise here. Um, and so it's uh, engagement can be a very useful tool um, to gather more information, to understand if the vision of the company or fund, whoever you're sitting across the table from, um, what is their view of their future? And does that align with where you see, not to keep going back to this hockey analogy of the puck, where the puck is going? Um, and, you know, I have had the pleasure of working with very large institutions doing sort of closed door engagements. And um, the knowledge that you gain from having those conversations and having a seat at the table is very, very valuable. However, there also comes a point where, you know, when you gain information, you, it enables you to make a more informed decision, but there also comes a decision point. And so um, I'll just give one example. I was working with large pension plans from around the world, this is several years ago, um, engaging with a very actually large, and I will, will remain nameless, a large energy company around looking at risk management. And there had been numerous incidents and accidents um, across their various uh, areas of operation. And um, there ultimately was a huge incident in the Gulf. Um, and um, there was investors that were in this, in this company that decided before that incident took place to actually sell their shares. This was not necessarily a political divestment announcement. This was in the context of having gained more information and the oversight of how that company was run at that time that they were not comfortable to continue investing because they didn't think it was a good investment. So I think there's, it, it's important to have that sort of carrot and stick approach, but there are also, um, you know, I would come back, back to that thing. It's like, what is your vision of the future, and is this company aligned with it or not, is one of the questions that I would definitely ask. And it, it, the thing that's interesting is, you know, whether it's that, um, you know, the conversation leading up to the decision or after the decision, all of that, it's clear that the companies are paying attention, right? You know, the large publicly traded companies in this space are, uh, not all of them, there's a spectrum, but a lot of them are making pretty big moves, right? So, you know, Shell, for example, just a week or two ago put out their, their sky vision and, and really talked about the fact that they see uh, solar energy as the dominant source of energy in the world globally uh, in, in just a few decades, not, not a time horizon that's, you know, a century away. Um, you see other companies, um, particularly in, um, in Northern Europe who uh, were traditionally in the oil and gas space and are now going, uh, you know, in the other direction. Uh, uh, so the Danish uh, oil and natural gas company, Dong, you know, changed its name to Orsted and is getting out of oil and gas and is developing offshore wind. Um, uh, Stad Oil is similarly going to change its name to move away from that, that, that uh, that being even labeled as an oil company and is uh, developing offshore wind as well, including uh, uh, investing in uh, a development asset here uh, uh, off the coast of New York. So we're seeing a lot of, of uh, evidence that those conversations are really having an impact. And I think the role, sorry, before just to me, I think the role as well, though, of asset owners is to suss out with the great research that Carbon Tracker and other organizations do is it greenwashing? Right. And when they lay out some beautiful plans and some very nice thoughts on the future, <laughs> um, do they continue to make progress down that road or do they not? And I'm sorry, I mm. let you get No, I, I, I think we, um, we're not advocating for divestment per se or we are saying probably you should start with the engagement side. I think, um, I think the Divestment has been incredibly helpful overall to change the dialogue and the debate. It's a, and it's a bit following the, what is that, uh, you have this little pirate picture and then you have like the beating will continue until morale improves. And I think it's a little bit that what is happening when you have more and more big investors starting to say, well, if you're not doing this here, we will divest. Uh, and I think the, the, the debate here is, it's a little, it's very easy to say, well, you either you own or you don't own, and then that's it. But you actually have to dig it down and say, well, what is oil and gas? What is your coal exposure? Where is it that you are divesting from? Because um, I think and that's also our view that we do not need any more coal. And the more coal we can shut down, the quicker, the better, and it will be better for these companies to move on and do something different. Uh, in more or less all scenarios that is being put forward in terms of the 
guiding the energy pathway from here and the transition to a transition to a low carbon economy a lot of that is going to be driven still by oil and gas and what is it co uh, renewable energy is 12 percent of the u.s uh, energy production uh, so it, it still takes a long time to really have a very big impact that's why we i think when the engagement and and these the divestment have to be a little bit more nuanced so uh, oil and gas companies they will still continue to be exploring and uh, extracting more oil and gas going forward i think it's absolutely a good idea to have them put forward more plan for how are they doing their transition as come back to the point i made before about what is the value of these companies because if they are not be able to replace their reserves then they're not valued what they are today and therefore you should be careful of investing in them uh, the coal companies mining companies yeah, that they as said they should be shut down the coal utility power plants which are very uh, reliant on that they have to uh, they are the area where we probably see the biggest risk near term for stranded assets especially when you look at the u.s market compared to europe you have already seen your power utility companies in europe uh, being uh, disseminated almost almost because they totally missed what's happening with the renewables dong energy uh, i was actually part of doing the ipo uh, the first time around in 2007 it was an absolute mess and the only company back then the only function of that company back then we said had any value was the offshore wind development and now 10 years later that's a business that they are in everything else they have uh, oh, not everything else but a very big part of what you are looking at Erstel, uh, as it's pronounced uh, <laughs> so don't worry um, is, uh, is is really on their renewable uh, on their renewable energy side so I think it's it's the debate is also a little bit more nuanced of, of where do you have an impact and where do you not uh, some of these companies it also raises some other questions on so if you have a power utility company uh, let's just I can recall the split but let's say Dominion which is I think Virginia if that company has half 50 50 renewable energy power and 50 percent coal is that an investment you divest from or what do you do with with this that that then is suddenly you said talk about gray zones that's when some of these things start to get a little bit more gray I think and, and that's also our argument is you need to have data from which companies have the worst exposure when you have the data you can come in and say what is your plan for this what is your plan for that and how do you get out of it uh, and that's way you can uh, you can come in and collaborative engagement I think is probably where it, it works out because from from my history as as a broker and a banker I've been on God knows how many road shows with company management CEO CFO selling their oil rig company or new project or something and they can sit in front of you one hour and then say well you're the first person who ever asked me about this question and then you go to the next meeting an hour later you're the first person who asked me that exact question so and and they can be with fidelity with wellington with Putnam, with whoever if you go if you just go to boston and they will have basically the same question but the management will say well you're the first one who ever asked us, asked us about that but if you get people 25 30 percent of capital in the room and asking that question there's nowhere to hide I'd like to open up maybe for some questions from the audience if you have any. We have a microphone, so don't be shy. You have them captive. Anyone? They've wowed you so much, you've wowed them. To a point. Well, I'll ask one more because then I, I have you captive, so I can be captive. I think it goes maybe Alicia you start with this it's you know talking about institutional investing you talk about long-term climate how do you respond to climate change isn't just an investment strategy right it's a resiliency and other things right. how do you take other institutional funds that we have in this state where it can work with the pension fund like the Green Bank which is a multi-billion dollar Green Bank right it's almost the size of right. what the Rockefeller Brothers fund is overall how do you take policies that we have in the state and how does it how can you make it all work together where you are sort of taking it to the next level in a smart way and how do you create an environment or a, a blueprint to do that in a political environment yeah I, well thank you for mentioning that and i love love talking about the work that the new york green bank is doing and um you know the traction that they're finding um in the work that they do which i'll just you know describe at a high level essentially as um, participating in project finance opportunities and clean energy markets 
here in New York. And, and as I've mentioned, we are uh, focused on the growth of those markets. And part of the piece of that is access to uh, competitive cost of capital. Um, and, and the role that Green Bank plays is really in, in being a, an active um, investor in that space and signaling to other investors the, the, the types of returns that they can expect to achieve, uh, partnering directly with them, leveraging even greater investment in these markets, and then again, picking up steam on that virtuous cycle I already talked about. They've um, only been around for a few years uh, in, in doing the work that they're doing. Um, uh, uh, just um, to give a couple of, of snapshots, though, um, already they've received over uh, uh, $2 billion worth of proposals for investment opportunities. And we're just talking about the state of New York, although we are, we are a significant market. You know, this is a, a single state. Uh, they've already deployed almost $500 million in capital towards, uh, again, stable, um, uh, stable investment opportunities in things like solar energy at the residential or commercial scale here in New York. Um, they are seeing uh, a tremendous uh, uh, co-investment appetite and really, um, you know, hearing increasingly from, uh, you know, pension funds and others who are looking for a vehicle to put, uh, to put capital to work directly in these markets. And, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that the New York Green Bank is creating that model, I think, is, is showing a number of others. And there are similar efforts, you know, elsewhere globally. Um, but it, it really is indicative of the sort of... Um, uh, you know, interconnectedness of this conversation to try and uh, find not only sort of publicly traded assets, but direct investment opportunities for uh, funds like pension funds. This is um, part of why the governor announced uh, late last year that um, the, the New York Green Bank would seek to build on the public sector funding. It's, it's enjoyed to date by, by expressly going out to the market to try to raise uh, private capital as well. And that's something that the Green Bank is evaluating carefully now in terms of what a strategy would look like. But we've absolutely seen the market demand, which uh, is incredibly exciting. Right. Maybe more generally for the, the panel, we're in a place of higher education. And one of the things that we have, we're not a private university system, but we do have foundations and many of our campuses and many are looking to invest in a more environmentally friendly way. What advice do you give to a Buffalo or a Stony Brook that wants to get into this? What should they be looking at when doing, uh, ent entering this activity where, you know, there's scarce dollars in the larger macro terms, but they do have some investment? Are there opportunities to pool together? What are some of those benchmarks or things that they should look for in getting into the space of decarbonizing or being more environmentally uh, responsible in their investing strategies? I think the first thing is to know what you own. So the first thing is to do an assessment of your portfolio and understand uh, across asset classes, where do you have exposure, both to uh, current investments that are in you know, renewables and alternative energy, and also where do you have, where do you have exposure to uh, traditional energy, and understand that first and foremost from a portfolio perspective. Um, we predominantly uh, look at strategies that are uh, fund strategies, um, and the market, as you were talking about, granted slightly different in terms of the scope of opportunities that we look at, um, is absolutely growing, and it's completely different than it was five years ago. I mean, and it's going to continue to change as you see things like resource opportunity, oppor resource kind of you know optimization strategies that are out there, all the way to clean renewable strategies out there. I mean, what we, where we can go today is very different than what we saw from a returns perspective and from an opportunity set and how deep that opportunity set is. So I think it's two things. One, it's knowing what you own. And then secondly, it's identifying, are you trying to diversify your portfolio? Are you trying to identify an element of your mission that you want to uh, uh, sort of invest in line with? And then if so, what is that element of your mission? So is it around, you know, advancing climate solutions? And so what does that mean? Um, I think the most important thing when you're talking about anything around removing something in portfolio is also around definition. So how fossil fuels are defined, like what does that mean? Is that just, you know, uh, exploration and sort of, you know, energy producers? Is that looking at downstream um, uh, companies? Is it looking at utilities? Like what does that mean both on the private and public side? And, you know, for the, on behalf of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the focus is really on companies both on the private and public side that own fossil fossil fuel reserves. Um, so it's not looking at utilities that don't necessarily 
own these assets, it's looking at those that actually do, but not just in the context of the energy sector, it's looking at those that own them more broadly, because that's where, you know, based on their mission and based on how they identify the risk, that's where, that's where the kind of the, the, the metal meets the road, so to say, or the rubber meets the road. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think a lot of, I'll echo what you're saying, is it's know what you own and know where the exposure is and also know what it is that you want and you don't want. Um, the emission, like we say, a, a, a power utility company, it's, it's fine to focus on the coal plants, uh, sorry, on the coal mining companies, but they are primarily selling to the power utility companies. So if the power utility companies are not demanding coal, that's bad for the uh, mining companies. There's opportunities oops, for the uh, utility companies. They can go nuclear. They can go uh, with um, renewable energies. They can do a lot of other different things. Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which is an arm of uh, Bloomberg, they had a big conference last week in uh, New York, their global summit. And I think flexibility, uh, we heard Total, the French company, uh, oil company, traditional, talking about their future as really energy as a service. Uh, looking at this as how can they become energy uh, providers for, for clients in different, in different ways, not necessarily just from oil, but also from, from other, other areas. Is that a company you should divest from and, and should you engage with or what should you do? It's very much about putting out the uh, outline for what do you think is happening. Get yourself educated about which direction uh, the energy transition is happening because this is a different bubble compared to the dot-com and the housing bubble and whatever other tulips and, and all these other things we have had in, in history because this is actually very much driving the foundation for how the uh, how the uh, economies are working, and it's also important to know again, like what are the what are the risks you're you're running. So we did a little uh, EV tracker. We, we we called it an electric vehicle tracker back in December, where we basically just were comparing what are automakers uh, predicting that they will produce or sell in terms of uh, electric vehicles, and what are and then compare that to what the oil and gas companies are coming out with. They all have their own predictions and so on. And the very short conclusion was that in 2016, we had like 2 million electric vehicles on the road globally of more than a billion cars. So it's, of course, still a small fraction, but uh, an electric vehicle will not, we, we will not require oil uh, going forward. Uh, the automakers expect that by 2020, they will produce or sell around 20 to 20, maybe 25 million cars on the road. The oil and gas companies also expected 20 to 25 million cars, but by 2030. So where the, where the reality will be, probably somewhere in between. But you cannot I invest in both areas, which are, you can say, a little bit mutually exclusive, and think that both of these companies are going to be winners in these areas. So it's very much about knowing where, what you own and also what you think are going to happen going forward and which technology areas you want to be involved in. Yeah, I just want to pick up on, on one of the really important points that, that you made there, um, which is, again, it's not only about uh, companies responding uh, to investor pressure or to top-down government mandates, but it really is also an incredible market pool from consumers looking for different types of, of energy services. And that has been uh, some, a trend that's become increasingly clear recently that uh, customers are demanding all, all, uh, you know, alternatives. Even if their customers aren't demanding it, um, their customers are demanding low-cost energy resources, and renewables have become so cost-competitive that that's where utilities see all of the growth, and that's what they're delivering to their customers. So there's not, um, you know, there's so many different different angles at which um, these companies are responding, and you see the uh, the growth happening, and 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 the role of of customers, and also to your point, Jim, about. Um, you know, institutions, you know, students and others are demanding these types of activities. And so that, that kind of bottoms up um, effect is having a real impact. Well, let's give a big round of applause to the panel for coming. And <laughs> I am happy to start the second half uh, where we will be discussing moving from fossil fuels to clean energy investing where there where we'll discuss new opportunities to grow uh, a, a sustainable portfolio while uh, de-risking and uh, disinvesting and decarbonizing and for that I'd like to turn over this panel of esteemed guests to our 
uh, director of our Center for Law and Policy Solutions, Katie Zuber. Katie? Thank you, Jim, and thank you to our panelists for being here today. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, as Jim mentioned, the title of this panel is Moving from Fossil Fuels to Clean Energy Investing, New Opportunities to Grow a Sustainable Portfolio While De-Risking. Uh, so we're going to be asking our panelists some interesting questions. They are going to follow along the lines of what are the benefits of clean energy investment strategy, uh, how can good investing maximize returns and still grow a clean energy economy? Uh, and what is the role of public-private partnerships in all of this, such as uh, New York Green Bank? And what are other pension funds and investors doing in this area? And we'll also talk a little bit about the uh, potential effects of a, of a transformation from a fossil fuel economy to a clean energy economy on the labor market. Uh, so I'll briefly introduce you to our panelists, and then I'll turn it over to uh, to them to tell you a little bit more about who they are um, and their experience in the clean energy um, economy. Uh, first here to my left we have uh, Peter Davison, co-founder, board member and CEO of the Investment Advisory Group Aligned Intermediary. We also have Alfred Griffin, president of the New York Green Bank. And then Kevin Hanel, Chief of the Bureau of Labor Statistics at New York State. So thank you guys very much for joining us today. And if you could just tell us a little bit about yourselves. All right. Uh, greetings. Hello. Good to be here. So Peter Davidson, Aligned Intermediary. Um, first, let me say it's good to be back in Albany because I used to be the executive director of the Empire State Development Corp, and my boss was Jim Malatris. So very nice to be back here. Right? Got you to come. That's back. it. <laughs> so that was it. So I was at Empire State um, Development Corp, and then after that, I was at the Port Authority, uh, doing running energy and economic development at the Port Authority, and then went down to Washington D.C. to work for the second term of the Obama administration. The U.S. Department of Energy and the big loan program, the, the, the loan program office of the Department of Energy, which is the largest um, clean energy lender uh, in the United States. We have a $40 billion portfolio. The mission of that organization was to make loans for, for new energy projects at massive scale. So it was really involved in the first deployment of new technologies that made energy more efficient and also for a low, lower carbon footprint. This is a program by Congress, so it supported low carbon fossil fuels, low carbon nuclear, and low carbon renewable and, and new innovation. So did that, and in that, that was really working with government resources to get projects going in the hope that once projects were demonstrated at commercial scale and large scale, it would prove those models out to the private sector at which case institutional investors and lenders and everybody would come into the market. Huge problem, which maybe we'll talk about, is how do you get the first projects into the market and going and proven in a way that bankers and investors will want to come in. So that was the mission of that program. Uh, I left, and then a number of institutional investors at that time were very interested in making investments in low-carbon energy, clean energy. And so they came together, pooled their resources, and said, the five of us, institutional investors initially, are very interested in committing resources into this space, investing in deals, making money in the deals. So no idea of concessionary capital. We just want to make money. But we're just not finding pathways to invest our capital. We're not finding funds. We're not finding direct investments. We just we need help doing that. So that was the mission, started really by four big institutional investors. <clears throat> they hired me, essentially, and then we created a team that works for our institutional investor members and only for them, like a co-op almost. We now, they've taken from four institutional members to 11, and we work for them going out and finding direct investment opportunities in what we call climate infrastructure which is clean energy, clean water, and waste to value, biofuels, waste to power, things like that. Um, so we work with our members to find any way that they want to invest institutional capital in the market. So we started with four very briefly. We now have 11 members 
who really uh, underwrite our organization, and that's UC, Re UC Regents, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of New Zealand, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Australia, WAFRA, which is part of the Kuwaiti uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund, Church of England, um, TIA CREF, Ontario Pension Trust, the Wellcome Trust in the UK, and Generate Capital and Leo DiCaprio Foundation. So those are our 11 members, and um, we're really figuring out how institutions can mobilize their capital at market rates of return. So that's, that's the background. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Alfred Griffin. I'm president of the New York Green Bank. Uh, I, I joined uh, the New York Green Bank in NYSERDA in the state in November of 2013. Um, I joined from Citigroup, where I'd been for the 17 previous years, um, working in uh, structured finance across a number of different asset types, but including energy and prior to the New York Green Bank, including uh, renewable energy. Uh, the New York Green Bank is a state-sponsored investment fund. We're a billion-dollar investment fund. And our mission is to accelerate deployment of clean energy uh, in the state of New York. And to do that by making certain where there are economically viable project types, uh, where there is uh, the ability to scale and replicate, that financing is, in fact, available. Um, we have uh, three basic investment criteria. It's pr pretty simple in terms of how we think about things. You know, one is that we are expected to be self-sustaining as an organization, meaning that our, our revenues from our investments need to exceed um, any all, all our operating expenses and any, any portfolio losses. So we need to make good credit decisions and earn appropriate returns. Uh, the second is that whatever we do should result in a reduction in greenhouse gases in the state of New York. So in terms of the types of technologies, that we're pretty fairly flexible. Really anything that works within the NYSERDA construct of what is called the Clean Energy Fund um, fits our mandate. But certainly things you think about in terms of clean generation, solar, wind, um, storage technologies, biomass, uh, energy efficiency, sustainable transportation, so forth. We're pretty flexible, but whatever we need, we do needs to result in a reduction of greenhouse gases in New York. So it's all about deployment of these sorts of assets in New York. And then third, whatever we do needs to be expected to result in financing market transformation. So, so one question we ask is, you know, why are we needed? If there is a, an active and liquid financing market with lots of participants, we're not here to, to, to undercut and crowd out those, those participants. We're really looking for those opportunities where there's a lack of liquidity, where we can play an, an additive role um, and, and actually help things get done or get done more quickly than they otherwise would. Um, the second part of that question, though, is you know, do, do we think we're focusing on markets that will need our support in perpetuity? Or do we think we're looking at markets that we can help overcome certain gaps such that they can be freestanding markets in terms of private sector capital um, on a standalone basis in the future? Um, and so those are our big three basic criteria. Um, um, being self-sustaining, uh, reduction in greenhouse gases, and, um, and, and uh, additionality. Um, in terms of um, additionality and what, what, what are we finding that is the role we can play that can really, really help open up markets, it's, it's a lot of in, in many similarities to what Peter's uh, describing um, in that there is a lot of institutional capital seeking to be invested in this marketplace. I mean, I think if you ask most any major bank or any, any major insurance company or any pension around the world, they would say we would like to find opportunities <coughs> to deploy capital for, um, for sustainable investments. Um, the, the issue is they need, they need to deploy capital at scale, put substantial capital to work. They need precedent <coughs> transactions. And if it's more of a portfolio approach, if you think about distributed generation, where it's lots of smaller projects and bundling those projects, these institutional investors need scale and standardization. And a lot of newer markets um, don't yet have that. And, and that's really where the Green Bank steps in, to step in, provide capital, to help some of these business models, in fact, scale up. 
Um, since being established in, um, in December of 2013, which was um, you know, a month or so after I joined, uh, we basically had a piece of paper saying we could exist. Um, so we built a team from there, um, built a pipeline, put in place our ops and procedures, and we've been closing transactions on a regular basis for about uh, two and a half years now. We've, we've deployed um, in excess of $450 million. We have a robust pipeline going forward of over $600 million, um, and that's just in the state of just in the state of New York, the $450 million of capital that we've deployed um, is related to about $1.2 billion in total projects being financed in the state because we're typically not the only capital provider in these projects. So we think we've had a lot of success in stimulating markets. Um, we have examples of where we have um, facilitated market activity and, and been fully repaid with the private sector taking over with um, with much greater activity. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll finish up by saying that, um, that in, the, uh, in the fall, Governor uh, Cuomo announced that um, we would be um, considering alternatives, uh, engaging an advisor to consider alternatives in terms of um, raising private capital at the portfolio level alongside the state capital and, and uh, so that we can do more in New York per dollar of ratepayer support, which is the source of our capital. And, um, and also um, seek to, to do the kind of things we're doing on a national basis, which will ultimately um, benefit scale, benefit standardization, diversification, and all these things will help create more market activity more, more quickly. Okay. Um, my name is Kevin Hannell. I'm with the New York State Department of Labor. I'm the chief of the Bureau of Statistics. We do um, a lot of the labor market numbers that you'll find out there such as the unemployment rate or the job count numbers that show up, which at this point you're probably wondering, what does that have to do at all with clean energy and green jobs? Well, I've been with the Department of Labor for about 18 years now. I started out as an economist, I've been a statistician, I've been a program researcher, so I've had a lot of jobs over the years. And a few years back, they asked me to take over and facilitate, it wasn't manage, but facilitate New York State's green job grants that we had received from the federal government. And these were pretty large grants where we did a large survey of businesses and industries in New York State. We reached out to them, uh, 20,000 different businesses and several different targeted industries, including the energy sector. And we asked them information about the green economy and how it was going on there, specifically because we're the Department of Labor with a focus on green jobs the training necessary, the employment numbers, how they were changing, um, whether or not these companies were growing, shrinking. Um, during that time, I learned quite a bit about what that market needs, what those industries are going through, and the expectations that those industries have, and how a lot of times during that study we found them not being met. So they ran into certain roadblocks and troubles. So that was a few years back. Uh, about a year ago, I actually was on a, a different project that I was working on where we focused entirely on the energy cluster in New York State, New York State's energy cluster, both fossil fuel and um, what they call the clean tech sector. Now, this isn't the same as our utility sector. Um, our utility sector has about 320 firms in it, but what they call the New York State Energy Cluster has almost 5,000 firms in it, well over 110,000 employees, and almost $10 billion in wages going out there. So this is a pretty important cluster. It's larger than a lot of the other industry clusters that we focus on, or even our traditional industry sectors that we publish and talk about. So during that time, uh, we gathered a lot of information. Using administrative data, we're able to take a look at these industries. We're able to take a look at the companies in these clusters and see what's going on there, um, where their growth is, who's going to be impacted. It might be a little broader than some of the sectors you're thinking about. For example, we took a look at um, gas stations. And a lot of gas stations are going to be impacted by changes going on in the economy now. That may not be the level that you're thinking, but it's what we've gone down and delved into the detail of trying to get into not just solar tech or solar industries, but we want to look and see how it's impacting the economy at all levels where jobs are impacted. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll just kind of dive right into our first question, some of which you have started to talk about in your remarks. 
For many years, we've seen the markets go up um, in fits and starts. It's often dependent on government policies, on investment, tax credits, and subsidies, even congressional action or inaction. So with prices going down, does it make financial sense, and is it prudent for investment managers to start to look at clean energy companies and clean tech to, be, to buy and hold their, their portfolios? Well, you go first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's it, the 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 clean the clean energy market, or sometimes we we describe it as sustainable infrastructure, which is really our focus. There are all <coughs> sorts of ways to invest. You know, there can be um, you know pools of capital invested in publicly traded equities that focus uh, that that may be considered um, clean and so forth. In terms of the New York Green Bank, we think about sustainable infrastructure and it's a it's a very large market um, that has been uh, growing uh, very steadily and will continue to grow in terms of um, of terms of in terms of activity for a variety of reasons including as you say um, you know strong policy particularly at the state levels and we're, have, we're blessed in New York to have great policy leadership here um, also reduction in, in pricing um, in terms of panels and soft costs and so forth, making uh, making these projects more economically viable compared to other alternatives, um, we're also benefiting from customer demand. I mean, you know, cor corporations and individuals and institutions they they want to reduce their carbon footprint, um, and um, and 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 great technological advances and aging uh, energy infrastructure demanding investment in some. And in many cases, a more distributed, cleaner model is the more cost-effective way of uh, replacing that infrastructure. So, so we have we have the 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 the, gra the, the, the groundwork and and and, the, and and a great platform in terms of um, all of us in this room that are looking to invest substantial capital. This is a market that needs attention. Um, in terms of returns, um, you, you can absolutely. And uh, it's, it's our view, and we know it's institutional's views, views. You have to get the right return for the risk you're taking, number one, and also the benefit of, of being clean. And we see lots of opportunities in that regard. Um, we, we generally think of our portfolio as being you know, primarily an investment grade type portfolio. Um, and, and we're picking up credit spreads that are um, materially, materially in excess of where sort of broader market, um, more liquid um, levels would be. So we think we are being well paid for um, being an early mover. Um, we've uh, seen evidence of that when we've been refinanced, um, where, the, where the financiers are taking us out at, 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 at cheaper, at lower spreads than we financed at. So I think it's a great opportunity. Um, and I'll pass it to Peter for your thoughts. Well, fully agree with Alfred that um, makes all the sense in the world. And I think you have to look at, say, your average pension fund out there in New York Common, New York City Pension, something like that. The return they need to pay the, the beneficiaries is basically 7%. So when people look at how much they need to make from their investments, it's 7%. And that's portfolio theory, why people diversify and all that. But you can invest. You've been able to invest for the past eight or nine years. You can continue to invest today in assets, which are renewable energy. Let's call it just renewable energy. The clean economy, which we talk about a lot, deals with transportation, deals with buildings, deals with heating. It's a big part of it. But the place where most people are moving capital is through renewable energy, investing in wind and solar. That's where the majority of capital goes. Those transactions in the market today are beautiful transactions for institutional investors because it's very cut and dried now, the technology. There is virtually no risk in constructing a utility-scale wind or solar asset. It's been done many times. Major companies, Bechtel, and Beck Turner, companies like that, will build them. You can get a full insurance wrap on the construction. So the risk associated with construction is minimal. There's so much data now on wind performance, on solar radiation um, performance, that you can really project out the, the uh, power that's going to come out of your system. So there's, that's very much de-risked. And then all projects basically have a signed contract with utility or a customer 
So you know what you're going to be selling your power for, for either 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years. So they're, unlike many other investments, there are very few pieces that are moving, very few pieces subject to chance. And that whole package, if you're the investor in that, you can generally earn, depending upon how much debt you're willing to put on it based on your risk preference, you can be easily earning 7 or 8% return on a levered basis in those assets. And sometimes you're willing to take a little more risk, smaller deals, funkier jurisdictions. That return can go up to 10 or 12%. So even the most conservative type of utility scale solar and wind asset, you can outperform the 7% bogey. So it is really a shock and surprising <coughs> that institutional investors, particularly pension funds and university endowments, which are really targeting that 6, 7, 8% return, are not much more fully invested in long-term contracted renewable energy assets just for the economic return, forgetting about the sustainability benefits, which everybody says they're interested in, but when it comes to them actually allocating capital, we all in the business realize it's much more talk than action. So you have to really win the day with <clears throat> the economics. So for institutional investors, particularly pension funds and um, endowments, investing in renewable energy makes all the sense in the world. So that's theoretically. The other, Susan, I'm going to turn it over. The other, um, <clears throat> the other concern institutional investors have is why do I want to learn about a whole new area, a whole new industry? It's a lot of work, and I'm not going to be able to commit the big capital, which Alfred says institutions want to do, $100 million at a time, with the idea that once your team and your staff within a pension learns an industry, they want to be able to deploy hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, in that area of specialty over the next five to six years. So if you look at renewable energy, in the United States last year, across the country, we, we built 28 gigawatts of power. That's the whole United States. Of that, 18 gigawatts, or 60%, was renewable energy. And that's been true. People don't realize that. For the last five years, the majority of energy built in the United States has not been gas, has not been coal. It's been renewable. So the idea we still have in our minds that renewable is fringe and emerging is just wrong. The majority form of energy generation, not only in the United States but around the world, for the last four or five years has been renewables. So that's just a statement of fact. If you look at what that is in terms of market opportunity, those 18 gigawatts that we built in the United States, all with these same type of characteristics, not that much construction risk, a customer buying the product, Prices haven't come down dramatically, but as a rule of thumb, it costs about $1.50 per watt to build new generation capacity. So for a gigawatt of power, that's about a billion and a half dollars. We built 18 gigawatts in the United States in 2016. 18 gigawatts times a dollar and a half is a $27 billion opportunity. That's what was spent in the United States on renewable energy two years ago. Some of that's debt, some of that's tax equity, but for equity investors, that $27 billion is at least a 7 to $10 billion per year opportunity. So the scale for institutional investors is, is huge. And that's just the United States. Globally, the United States produces about 20% of the energy in the world. So in the same time, when we built 28 gigawatts, the world built 160 gigawatts of renewable energy. The equity opportunity, if you're a global investor, it's seven billion in the United States. It's about 30 billion overseas, right? And those markets are growing even faster. So the opportunity which exists now, kind of 40 billion global equity opportunity per year and growing, coupled with the fact of the return expectations you can get, it really is one of the best places um, to be an investor, and that's without the environmental benefits. And the mystery that all of us deal with in, in, that are the, in this space is institutional investors investing in renewable energy assets, it's less than 1% of their portfolios. So it's very much, it's under-indexed in terms of where they should be, and we can talk about that, why that may be later on. 
And to, to, to state the obvious, um, when, you, when you refer to earning 7% returns, if the majority, if not all of that, is current cash flow, right? Mm -hmm. With a typically escalator, so a, a exactly. current cash of 7% that's, that's growing by 1.5% to 3% a year yep. over, over a long period of time. So it sounds like there's a lot of opportunities for moving forward here that investors can begin to kind of make this transition into investing into a clean energy economy without making significant um, sacrifices with respect to returns. But um, And maybe um, Kevin can speak a little bit to this question here, but what does a um, clean energy economy look like? So as we move away from a fossil fuel economy to a clean energy economy, what does that look like uh, from the labor market perspective? Well, one thing we did learn is that a clean energy economy actually doesn't look that much different than what we, we have traditionally. There's big advantages to switching to clean energy, but a lot of people get scared because they, they look at the future and they think this is going to be a completely new, different world out there. But it's not. Um, you're going to have energy companies, whether or not they're working with fossil fuels or they're working with solar. You're going to have energy companies that are going to be supplying energy. You're going to have the same type of people working in them, power plant operators, line operators, whatever you need to do to get people out there. One thing that we found is a lot of the companies, when we did our surveys, do both. They, they end up, uh, oftentimes, for example, a construction company would have a carpenter goes out, he's working on a job. The next day he goes out, he's working on a green job. The carpenter didn't change during that day. He had a new skill. He had to do a few other different things than he usually does to, to be a green carpenter. But it's the same guy, same position. A lot of these companies, I'm sure, are going to be in the market. Uh, once the investments are made, you're going to have the same labor force out there working there. The only thing that we've noticed a little bit different with the green tech is there's a few specialty positions, but not as many as people think. So there will be some education and training. Again, companies like to do that in-house. They like to take their own people, retrain them, and reuse them rather than try and go out and get new people about. So there's some kind of um, question as to why investors are so uh, reluctant to move into this area. So could you comment a little bit uh, on what are some of the barriers that limit investment into renewable energy? And how do we get large investors to be able to move um, their capital? So, um, uh, Peter, you talked specifically about finding some of the pathways. So, again, what are some of the barriers to getting investors to transfer their capital? And, and what are some of the pathways um, that they can use to transfer that capital? Can I come back? Because I'd like to just add, sure. talk about the job thing yeah. for a second. Oh, sorry. I think yeah, absolutely. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't see a chance to jump in there. So. Um, this job thing is fascinating, and you have to look the way it's really worked some places around the world. You look at, at, at Denmark, which now everyone thinks is great, but that country has been built really now its, its latest, obviously it's been around a long time, but the latest surging nature of that country is all built upon what they have done in renewable energy. And they have become the leader of, of blade technologies, a couple of companies there, Vestas and Siemens, which is a German company, but they really base their wind operations out of, out of uh, Denmark. And they, start, they built those industries. They built those industries with state support, very heavy state support. And then their pension funds came in to really back a lot of these projects, even when some of them were. So, so they, they, the pension funds provided the capital to back some of the projects. The governments had um, mandates or, port, or renewable portfolio standards to buy energy here was onshore energy and then offshore wind, which is really where offshore wind was created by those companies. So they put money on this table in terms of government mandates, and then the companies bid and won the opportunity to create the turbines, and then those deals were financed in part by the state pension funds. So it was a beautiful world of innovation. If there were conservatives there at the time, people were shrieking that it was not buying energy at the lowest cost, so it was a misuse of public dollars. So that whole political discourse was had, and it's been had in many countries around the world. And some of those early PPAs were at a higher price. But now if you look what's happened, those two companies, Vestas and Siemens, both based, both based there, dominate the world for, for turbines. They are the market massive market share, massive employment in that country, and now the price of both onshore wind and offshore wind 
are at historic lows and are both grid, grid competitive. So they're real examples of what can work. Um, when we're talking about the states, I agree, New York is, is doing great work now, unifying government and unifying the, really putting the mandate on the table for what government should be buying. And if you look at Massachusetts, which has really done probably the strongest job in offshore wind, they now have, the government has made tenders require the utilities to buy offshore wind. As a result, they have three significant offshore wind companies bidding for it. And they're basically rebuilding the city of New Bedford into a new hub for offshore wind. So it's been dramatic economic growth in that city, um, all caused by the very smart integration of government policy um, with, with corporate participation. OK, so that's that. Um, <laughs> so the question on barriers. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to keep talking. You want to get in there? Go, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I'll, um, you're on a roll. Okay. You've got the mic. Well, I just like to think about the people. So when <laughs> people come up, you've got to talk about the issues. Um, so barriers to the market. Let's go back to the pension funds. I talked before about why pension funds aren't doing it. That's a U.S. phenomenon. Pension funds in Canada and pension funds in the Baltics, particularly in the Danish and Dutch, I always get confused, but Danish countries, Dutch countries, Norwegians, Scandinavians, their pension funds invest in renewable energy. They've been doing it for 10 years, and they were actually providing the bulk of that. And they've had excellent results. <coughs> One of the issues we have is they're all private pension funds, and they don't disclose information. So getting the data on the actual performance of these pension fund investors is difficult to get. So that's one of the reasons we can't fully publicize, but those when you talk to people there, their performance has been very strong. Now, here's a little detail and problem. Those pension funds, jobs in those pension funds in those countries are high status jobs and they're highly compensated jobs. A portfolio manager who works for a Canadian pension fund and has been there 15 years and is fully as competent as someone who works on Wall Street, in Canada will be paid anywhere from 250 to $500,000, right? good salary, and that's what they get. That same worker doing the same function, working for New York State Common, cannot make more than $120,000. That person working for the Alabama State Pension Fund, where they are government employees, the governor of that state makes, I don't know, $120,000. So nobody who works in the investment portfolio can make more than that. So it's a chronic problem we have with pension, public pension funds in the United States that the staffs within those organizations cannot be paid as well as their compatriots in other pension funds around the world, and certainly they aren't paid as well as people that they interact with every day at investment banks, private equity firms, and money management firms. So young people, talented, go work at pension funds. As soon as they get a job from somebody on Wall Street or money manager, they leave. Um, so there's a real problem of human talent in the pension funds. And it, it takes a long while to learn the business, understand it. And so we have to solve that structural problem of compensation for people who work in public pension funds in the United States. They've solved that overseas, and that's so they don't have problems with, with pension funds and foundations um, making investments so much overseas. But so in the US, the way pension funds move their capital is either doing direct investments, which is what we are now really set up to do, find direct deals. But we then have to interact with people within the pension funds who have to take their, become the fiduciary. So it's the same levels of, of those pension funds having to do the deep due diligence. For those pension funds that are staffed that way, it's a great partnership. But the majority of pension funds, foundations, um, and, and sovereign wealth funds really are not staffed with deal professionals, so all their money goes out to third-party managed funds. BlackRock, Blackstone, Ares, KKR, those type of people. Um, and funnily enough, even though there's so much growth as we've been talking about, if you're an institutional investor today and you want to invest in a fund that only invests in renewable energy, you have shockingly few choices. BlackRock has a fund, Brookfield has a fund. They're basically three funds that are over a billion dollars 
you need to be over a billion dollars because if you're an institution like New York Common, the minimum amount you will invest in any fund is a hundred million dollars. So if you're a big fund, it has to be a billion dollar fund. So the actual mechanics of being able to invest, it is difficult. It's been a challenge. There are more and more funds are being launched, so that's a problem which should be going away. But that's one of the historic barriers. Yes, I, I, a few other things to add. Um, in, in conversations that we've had over the, the years, um, it, you know, it's, it seems that one, one of the issues is, you know, P Peter indicated um, in, in one of the earlier um, parts of our discussion that you know, the, the return thresholds that pension funds need to meet on a holistic basis is seven, seven and a half, eight percent. Um, these projects deliver that spot on with very steady cash flows um, with relatively low risk. So you would say, why, isn't, why, why aren't dollars pouring in? Um, a lot of reasons, including some of those that Peter has alluded to, but, um, but you know, one thing about these investments is they typically are illiquid. And, um, and there is, uh, for some pension funds, there's a, you know, a requirement that um, only a minority of their portfolios can be in illiquid investments. Um, and the majority needs to be in, in liquid, things that bonds and stocks that trade on the exchanges. Um, so if you, if you think about where yields have been on publicly traded bonds, um, and if they've been at you know, 2, 3, 4%, and you need to hit a 7 or 8% threshold, and you're very, you, know, you only have a small allocation to illiquids, you sort of have to go for more aggressive strategies um, for those illiquids in terms of opportunistic credit funds and private equity funds and so forth to try to, you know, bring up that average return to a 7-8%. So I think, um, I think if, if, if pensions could, could find a way to, to have, a, have a box that these types of investments would fit in where they're not compared to um, more aggressive opportunistic credit or perhaps more aggressive private equity, but, but as a fixed income comparison, a true sort of more investment grade-like in nature um, fixed income comp, but some, some ability to, to expand that illiquid box, um, I think that could create, create more activity as, as well. Um, it, it also, to, to, to Peter's point, it seems that a lot of uh, you know, pensions in the U.S., unlike in Canada and other countries, don't do direct investing. As Peter said, they go through third-party managers. And if you think about the comp structures at, um, at, the, at the Black Rocks of the world and the KKRs of the world, um, it's really about you know, g generating, in part, you know, it, it, the highest levels of returns you possibly can in order to earn the most in, in carry and so forth and the most economic benefit for the organizations. And that's where I think Peter, Peter and Aligned Intermediary has a great model where they say, well, you know, we'll do, if I understand it correctly, we'll do a lot of the front end work for you. We'll help you um, manage these assets over the long term, but we'll do it in a way that, that you, you, in effect, own these assets um, for the long term, and, and, and you're not sort of forced into a, a strategy where, where a private equity fund needs to, needs to buy and then sell seven years ago, trigger a short, you know, a medium term gain, get a carry on that, and so forth. So I feel like there's some some dynamics there that can be improved. And then I, you know, I, I think it, regardless of what the investor type is, I think, you know, you always sort of, you know, circle back to this scale issue. Um, and as Peter said there, you know, if you think about utility scale, wind and solar, there's some chunky, chunky transactions getting done, but there's a, a huge other part of the market and actually a, a, a faster growing part of the market that's all about smaller individual transactions. So, so I think you, um, you, know, pe you know, pensions need to find um, intermediaries, however they might be structured, that can help aggregate those portfolios on, those behalf, on their behalf so that they can actually um, deploy capital at scale. Uh, so Peter, you've worked closely with a large number of investors um, at Aligned Intermediary, um, and some have been more successful than others. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what separates those who are um, more successful from those who are, are less successful and what kinds of advice you might have there? Yeah, well, many of the investors we've had have looked before into the clean, um, clean economy markets. There was a big push to do that about 10 years ago, and that was kind of when the whole clean tech um, thing was very much in vogue. 
So many of these investors invested, some directly, but through funds in clean tech. Um, and with the whole tech implosion that happened about 10, or 10 years ago, um, most of those investors not only didn't get a return, they lost a significant amount of money. So that really turned them off to this sector. Um, what they were investing in were technology companies focused on this space. So a lot of the early solar companies, people with better solar panels, people with better types of uh, wind engines, essentially. And those were a number of problems. This technologies have turned out not to be a good place to invest in the clean energy area. So at the time that those institutional investors going through funds were investing in clean tech, that's when some of the overseas pension funds really began deploying significant amounts of money into the deployment of wind and solar. So providing the project equity into a special purpose vehicle that owned one or two uh, solar wind assets. Some of the other investors in that early on were the insurance companies. John Hancock and Mass Mutual have been long-term investors in this area and have done very well. Um, so it's kind of people now, now it's, very, it's virtually impossible for any company that's a venture company in the clean energy space to raise capital. <coughs> Extremely difficult because of what happened before. But more and more money is now flowing into the deployment uh, end of it. I think what people have also learned, because this is important for the political people here, it's governments, and as we all know, we're pretty much, we, we kind of, the uh, energy in the United States is state by state. There's no centralized energy policy in terms of the move towards renewable. It all has to be legislatures in a state, and the governor decide to make clean energy a priority. They pass legislation, and then they are tasked, they give that instruction to the utility regulators. And then the utility regulators mandate to the utilities that they have to buy renewable energy. That's the way it works. And what's happened in this country, it used 15 years ago, only one or two states had that mandate. Um, now there are 30 states that have an actual mandate, and on a, on a legislative basis, 12 are, are uh, voluntary. So it's really that initial mandate to the utilities, and the utilities have to buy energy that creates the market and gets it going. So institutional investors have now become very sophisticated, if they're the ones, the, the, those that are in the space, in looking at the lead that government has done. So has government made mandates in place? How strong are those mandates? What's the nature of that mandate? Is it a feed-in tariff type of mandate? which is much more positive to institutional investors, or is it kind of a Rex trading system, which could be good, but the prices bounce up and down, and, and it's, it's hard to describe the right value to that long term. So states have gotten much more um, efficient, and that's what's really driven the growth of wind and power over the last 15 years. And now what people are very excited about, those same dynamics of states passing laws, pushing mandates, mandates driving demand, um, demand and lowering costs, making it a, a beneficial circle. That same thing is happening now with battery storage, storage deployment. It started with just California. One or two years ago had mandates for storage. Now it's New York is, is a real leader in that now. New York, Massachusetts, California, um, Hawaii, and Oregon. So six or seven states are doing it. That's probably going to grow to 30 also. So storage is going to be a real opportunity. Same thing is happening now with EV, EV infrastructure, EV charging, EV deployment. So to answer the question, government is such a key player in the deployment of renewable energy, and institutional investors have now become much more sophisticated in tracking what governments are doing. Well, if, if the, in terms of uh, following up on the theme of policy, would it, um, yeah, so um, I, one, one thing I've really enjoyed about this, this role at the New York Green Bank, and, and the Green Bank is not a, a policy setter, but, but where we sit, we have an opportunity to work closely um, with uh, the policy setters in the, in the governor's office and uh, at NYSERDA who are helping establish this, the, the policies in the, in, the, in the Public Services Commission. So it's been, it's been really interesting for me to see very directly um, to state what should, should be the obvious, I suppose, but how important 
policy is. I mean, I, I can see things happening on the policy side that starts creating activity that we can finance very rapidly. And, um, and, and you can see where the policy is off, off a little bit and it needs to be tweaked a bit. Um, and you know, if, if they're not policies in place to, uh, to drive uh, activity and viable business models, then there's, there's, not, there's not anything for us to finance. So um, as mentioned earlier, we're, we're, you know, at the New York Green Bank, we're very blessed to be in the state of New York where we have outstanding policy uh, leadership uh, from uh, Governor Cuomo's team uh, down through the ranks. Um, you know, th there can be different forms of, um, of policy. So in the state of New York, um, the approach New York take, it's, takes is not to require utilities to buy renewable energy. And we've had tremendous growth in this market and will continue to see tremendous growth. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've recently had a main tier solicitation. I, I think it's 22 utility scale projects are now on the board to get done. Um, without a requirement for utilities to buy the energy. So there's going to be um, lots of front of the meter, chunky solar projects in the state of New York in the next couple of years with a lot of capital that will need to be invested. And uh, they're being structured without volatility in the rec contracts. So you'll have a um, highly financeable package to, to, to finance around. So that's, that's a real opportunity. Um, same in offshore wind. Um, there's uh, a lot of emphasis in offshore wind in the state of New York. There's going to be billions and billions of investment opportunity in the state of New York um, with offshore wind. Um, as Peter mentioned, storage. You know, we, again, we have a different approach. It's about finding ways to appropriate, appropriately compensate um, private sector intermediaries for the various values of these assets and um, with the directive of, uh, directive of Governor Cuomo in a state of the state in January, there will be 1,500 megawatts done in New York by 2025. Um, so, you know, policy is key. Um, New York is a leader in that regard. And, you know, I know we all want to see as much consistency and standardization state to state as possible. Um, we're all, you know, we're, we all have our own states, but Governor Cuomo and the governors of uh, California and Washington formed the U.S. Climate Alliance that was announced in the fall, and um, where there is uh, a, 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 an approach towards consistency and exchanging ideas on the policy front. I'm not engaged in all these conversations, but I do know there is at least a once a week um, conversation with a set agenda um, to share ideas to, um, to, to establish ways to, um, to, to broaden these markets and have the best possible policy. And I think, Victoria, now there are 14 members, is that right, of the U.S. Climate Alliance? 14 plus Puerto Rico. 14 plus Puerto Rico um, and uh, representing over 48 percent of the U.S. economy um, that are all standing behind uh, the, 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 the Paris Accord ag agreements. And, um, and on, the, on, on, the, on the Green Bank front, in terms of you know, tr trying to create more activity um, like uh, we're doing here in New York across the country. We're very engaged with other states and members of the U.S. Climate Alliance in terms of working with them to establish activities such as those that we have in New York and in those other states. I, I just wanted to add to something you said earlier. Um, with the, I, I can't talk about policy because I work with historical numbers. So I look at trends and things that happened previously. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future if they change the policy or something like that. But right now, uh, within the last few years, we've looked at the energy sector, and the majority of it is fossil fuels. It's, it's what, three quarters is going to be fossil fuels. And the other sector, however, happens to be growing. Clean energy and everything connected to it is growing about two to three times as fast when you talk about jobs and wages in New York State. So as that goes through, we look at that and we see that as a great area where um, policy can be focused. That's, the opportunities are there. Uh, and especially, if you look at it, it's um, not just in the energy generation, but you mentioned the batteries, you mentioned the EV vehicles. That's where we're seeing some of the strongest historical growth. We don't know whether that will continue or not, and it'll be a lot based on policy, but that's what there's now. And, and, I, and I, I feel like we're, we're, we're talking about a lot of details about policy and this, that, and the other, and, and knowing the audiences about how, you know, how, how pensions potentially can invest dollars. I think, I think the, 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 
the, the big picture behind all this conversation is there is going to continue to be billions upon billions upon billions of activity in this market. And if you're, if you're not fully so engaged in digging into what that opportunity is, you, you should be. Well, thank you very much to all of you. I think we're actually going to open it up to the floor uh, for questions. Um, so if you have any uh, questions that you'd like to ask um, Alfred or Peter or, or Kevin. I knew Jim was going to have one. <laughs> Uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> uh, I have two. One is on the labor front. Some of what we were hearing when I was in the government and even today is, is the labor force and the training for the labor force keeping up with sort of the changing economies, right? So we talk clean tech all the time. We talk green jobs all the time. But there seems to be a gap, a sort of employment gap where willing and able people. So that's one question made for you. Second piece is you, we talk about we talk about solar, you talk about wind. There's a lot of tech or batteries now even better technology is exciting because you're demand side reduction and other things. There's a lot of technology in there, right? Not all the solar not all solar panels are the same, not all wind turbines are the same. Are there commercialization activities or opportunities in investment that you could also couple in New York State to our university centers or other places in order to spur uh, some economic Activity to not just some you know major companies, but are there are there investment opportunities in the commercialization process too that you would be interested in as a green bank or as a private institutional investor? And do we have a workforce to actually keep up with what we're talking about? Um, the good news is yes, we have a workforce that can keep up with what we're talking about. the The whole point with the workforce is as politicians and other policymakers make decisions and try to, to drive things forward, they're always going to be concerned about the workforce and what's going to be happening to the people, especially in industries where they might be displaced. Um, and that's why I was trying to say earlier, I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunities in the green economy, and I think it's going to be easy to move people over there. If people are expecting this to be an economic bonanza where there be more jobs generated, I've heard that before. The experience back in 2010, we trained people for so many um, wind turbine jobs, and they all came out. The expectation was there'd be a fantastic opportunities for them. It never happened. So there has to be a connect between what's happening, and it has to be at a pace that the market can, you know, take the people and get them ready for the new jobs. But why, they're there. Why was that? By why? Was there a disconnect in the market? Was there a marketplace failure? What was the issue? Right. Oh, at, at that time, a lot of money flowed out immediately, and there was a very, very fast pace. New York State Department of Labor and the consortiums that were formed around it were told they had about a year and a half to two years to investigate, to learn about the green market, to find out about clean energy, and find out what jobs and training were going to be needed. Three months after that, grants went out for people for training. They had to be ready in six months to start training. So by the time the people trying to figure out what was going on in the market got the answers, we were chasing you know, the back end of the, the cart there. We, we were behind it. People had already had to start planning, getting stuff ready, and using the best information they had available, they made great strides in doing that. That's why one of the reasons I enjoy working with labor market information and, and working with these numbers, I know where the job markets are going. I know what businesses are growing, which ones are shrinking. We share that information with NYSERDA for their green job studies. We work closely with ESD, Economic Development uh, in the state of New York, to try and make sure that our information is out there so people can use that as they make investment decisions or policy decisions that are going to impact our labor market. Kevin, so was that before the government was driving the jobs as opposed to now we've got government pushing industries to drive the jobs that would create the job market for these I think at that time it wasn't the government so much driving the jobs as the fact that the, the government was trying to provide training and they wanted to get that training out there as quickly as possible for jobs that they expected. They just knew that the jobs were coming but what they knew turned out to be wrong in that case. And that was a very big disappointment for a lot of people, not just investors who may have lost their money,
put the people who trained for those jobs. There was a lot of people that ended up getting burned at that time, and there's been some caution since then. I think we've also learned this, correct me if I'm wrong, but so many of the jobs now in clean energy are in the deployment, the building and deployment, construction jobs are to that Not deployment, and in the selling, salespeople out there doing that. So that's been a huge employer. I think what we all thought was the tech part would be much bigger. And what happened there, we ran into state-based policies. So the Chinese basically took over the entire world of manufacturing solar panels. Bad if you were in the solar manufacturing business and were an investor, right, Solyndra and all that. But incredible benefits to all of us as consumers. So it's really, it's like everything with trade. It's a, it's a two-edged sword. The reason, one of the real reasons solar prices have come down so quickly is because of Chinese state policy to dominate that industry and has brought it down. Same with same things really happened with, with um, the Danes in Denmark with bringing down the cost of wind. And they, the technology for the wind industry is in Denmark. Technology for such a big part of the solar industry is now in China. You can debate that good or bad, but, but that's where we are. Just one last thing on that thing, it's very interesting. So as I mentioned, we have members who really join us to find opportunities. One of our most recent members is the National Association of Trade Building Unions, NABTU, which is an umbrella organization for the building trades. And they have the sheet metal workers and the IBEW, the electricians. And these are the workers who are building utility scale solar and utility scale wind. And it's the workers who have been working on these things that have gone to their pension managers and say, look, we're building these projects and they're great projects and someone's making a lot of money. Are our pension funds investing in them? And the pension funds looked and they said, no, we're not. And we don't really even know how to get into this space. So then they've kind of joined us now as a way to respond to the um, interests of, their, of the workers and the members to get into climate investing. Heather, we actually had a question over here and directly behind you as well. This is from the peanut gallery. <laughs> um, at least in terms of rhetoric, the federal government appears to be ambivalent about renewables. Um, is, does that have any meaningful impact on the, if you will, the investment sector? Um, you, you indicated that largely states are driving the market question mark that's a great question it's a question um, <coughs> we I, I certainly hear and I'm sure we all hear fairly freak, frequently I was at a, a conference uh, downtown in the city this morning and the same question came up and since I'm the I'm the state guy it came to me um, I mean I think I think certainly you can you can see um, there's some impact on the margin of what happens at the federal level. So, you know, like at the at the end of the year last year and coming into the first of the year, some some of the activity in terms of deployment of solar slowed a bit as the trade case was settled at, out. The, the you know the, the the tax law change and structure was put into place, and and some of that is just so you know what the landscape is. You know what what are you dealing with and how to structure around it. So, so 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 it would be unfair to say that. It doesn't have any impact, but but really the the activity for the last several years has really been driven at the state level and by state leadership. Um, with New York being one of the examples, um, it's the it's the policies that the state is putting in place and putting forth that is driving activity. Whether it's New York Sun, which has created a lot of solar activity, whether it's the main tier solicitation I just referred to. Um, community distributed generation, which is going to be a, huge, a, a very large market, it's putting in place the policy that enables that with the appropriate types of incentives to drive scale and drive down pricing that, that, that at least in my seat is, I, is what I see really impacting this market the most. Yeah. And I think we have time for one more. Yes, hi, Kevin. Um, as far as the labor market, the jobless economy, automation, technology, artificial intelligence, it is making an impact in all industry, but how about in the solar and renewables, excuse me? Um, in solar and renewables, there's some examples. You mentioned um, when our expectations for retraining people were 
very technical. The wind turbine engineers were really big. But the job was in sales. So retraining somebody from selling heating oil to selling solar panels is not a big, big deal. Right. People can learn that, and companies like to retrain themselves and, and do stuff like that. They'll take and they'll teach their own people. <laughs> However, if you've got a heating oil driver and their job goes away, that's something that, that's going to be very different. With solar and uh, electric generation, there's not a big number of jobs there that are, are new or specialized. The same concerns that you're going to have in the labor market for almost every industry are going to be impacting solar and um, renewable electrical, probably even a little bit less than they're going to be impacting the traditional fossil fuels. And one last question. Ha, I faked you out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Where is China in all of this? You talked about some of the European countries and what they're doing. What I understand is China really wants to be a leader in a lot of different ways, including uh, renewables. And I think I read like 300 billion just in three years in, in renewables. So is that something for us to be concerned or to take notice of? And do people take notice of it? Well, under the Obama administration, it was a it was a major issue of concern. It was a major because it's China or the U.S. will be the leader of the clean energy future, and this administration, in addition to all the other issues, is kind of abandoning that whole fight. So the Chinese and what they're doing is phenomenal, and I'm extremely complimentary about it. They are far and away the leading. As I mentioned, we did. Last 2016, we did 18 gigawatts of renewables, wind and solar. China last year did 60 gigawatts, so they're four times the size of what we're doing. Um, and so they're now the leader in deployment. They're already the leader in manufacturing of solar. They're getting aggressively into wind. And they have the benefit of just brutal state mandates, right, like no messing around. So. The deployment is getting um, much stronger, a lot of it caused by environmental issues they've been having, but it's also they're going through the same generational change that the rest of the world is and realizing that CO2 emissions are a huge problem. So um, those of us who had been in the federal government on this wish that we could have the same type of policy tools that were being implemented in China. They are really doing a very, very good job in this area. Now I'm talking about human rights or all the other areas, but in clean energy deployment, they're doing a very good job. Um, and what they want to do is kind of migrate up the whole chain. So they really want to start creating companies and getting the technology and a big part of their exporting, this whole Belt and Road initiative which they're doing, is all about exporting their renewable energy thing. So they have seen that as a really strategic advantage in the world, and so they're just you know, chuckling even more at us when the national government withdraws in, in that battle, right? That's why I want to be in that, in the Pacific Trade Agreement. That was very beneficial for the United States in clean energy deployment. We're out of that now. So. Any other questions for our panelists? Okay, well, uh, please join me in thanking them. Uh, our thanks to all of you for, for coming in here today. I am just going to briefly turn it over to Jim for a few closing remarks Sorry. and then we will... Okay. Peter, to end on a depressing <laughs> no. note that China's taken over, but there's hope. I know there's hope. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the panelists. Awesome. How are you? Uh, we'll be putting the video and materials up online, so check out oh, us at the Rockefeller Institute or rockinst.org. Um, and uh, we'll have more follow-up soon. So thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>